pray. Let's uh, get to the Word, all right? God, we thank you so much for your Word to us today. We thank you for the richness of it. We thank you that you just constantly speak to us. God, that you're doing so many different things all the time. And we thank you, God, for that. So, Lord, would you quiet our hearts and quiet our minds that we would hear your voice speak to us, Father. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Even there, pray, quiet our hearts and minds. You ever in your own quiet time with the Lord? <laughs> you ever have times where you're just like, am I even doing this right? <laughs> you ever, one day you feel like, man, I'm, like I'm, I'm just I'm failing in the area of my walk with God. The next day you feel like you're just knocking out of the park and then back again and just not really sure what you're doing. Any, anybody else feel that way? Some just um, maybe sometimes lacking the confidence of, of approaching God or how to approach God. and It can be challenging. I don't want to talk. I believe that Apostle Paul shed some light in kind of an indirect way on, on some of these things. And so as we look now, we're moving in our series, we're moving into Ephesians chapter 3. I want, I, want to, I want to look at this. And in fact, we're going to take a, a, a little bit longer portion of the text today. Um, and I just want to kind of commentary style, we'll just walk through the text, okay? Uh, the first paragraph or so is, is really going to hit on some of the themes that we've been talking about as it pertains to the unity of the body of Christ. And so we'll just jump in, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1. Uh, verse 1 says this, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. Okay, just so we make sure we have the setting as we move forward. What is he talking about? Prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of the Gentiles. Uh, well, very literally, what it means is that Paul is writing this letter from prison. So he's in prison writing to the church in Ephesus. So he's a prison, uh, prisoner of Christ Jesus. He, he's a prisoner for what reason? Because he's preaching Christ. He's preaching in a time where uh, even though Jesus, the Messiah, has come, the fulfillment of all the Old Testament scriptures, so many of the Israelites and the, the, the leading teachers and whatnot, uh, they, they, they denied Jesus' divinity. They denied that he's the Messiah. So they continued in the Old Covenant customs. So prisoner of Jesus Christ. Paul's out there. He's declaring Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He's the one that all the Old Testament points to. And so they're like trying to shut him up. They throw him in prison. So he's writing the letter from prison. But it says, for the sake of you Gentiles. Now, here's the deal. They didn't like the fact that they were preaching that Jesus is the Messiah because that really messes them up. But what really got them um, uh, set them off, what really threatened them was the fact that Paul specifically, and he's going to go into more detail of this in the, in the following verses, Paul specifically was called to say that, the, that because Jesus is the Messiah, because of what Christ accomplished through the gospel, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, he has now invited the Gentiles to be one with the Israelites, with God's holy people, right? We, we talked about that through chapter 2. And that really threatened the Israelites because Gentiles are bad guys, right? There's that, that, that barrier between the Gentiles and the Jews. And so what Paul is saying here is, I'm thrown in prison because I was preaching Christ to the Gentiles, inviting the Gentiles in, and that was a threat, threat to them. So Paul is writing from prison, having just been arrested for preaching Christ and preaching salvation to the Gentiles. Verse 2, we'll can keep on going. What's interesting here is it almost kind of sounds, it, it, Paul sometimes, when you're reading it, Paul sometimes sounds a little cocky, for lack of a better word, okay? I, I mean, just listen to him. Surely you've heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is, the mystery made known to me by revelation. Doesn't that sound so cryptic, right? Magical. <laughs> the mystery that was made known to me by revelation as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which is not made known to people in other generations, as it's been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets, which he's throwing himself in that category, right? So it, he kind of just starts his paragraph like, hey, guys, hey, let me paraphrase. I have a secret of God that nobody else knows about, Right? I know the mysterious insights of the divine that have been hidden from all generations until right now. 
I've got God now. Now, if somebody walked in to church today saying that, I'd be skeptical at best, right? But this is the mystery that he's talking about. The mystery that he just explained with this Gentiles and Jews being brought together. Verse 6, this mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and shares together in the promise in Christ Jesus. The mystery that he's referring to is that the Gentiles and the Israelites are now one under Christ. Now he, he's going to, so that really is kind of a transition paragraph from what we've been talking about to where we're heading. Verse 7. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. This verse, I could, well, as soon as I read it, I instantly had a picture of Paul's conversion experience. And I have to, I have to suppose that even as he's penning these words for the first time, he's thinking back on that moment when, when Jesus supernaturally appeared to him and his life was changed forever. Right? Think, think about the, the words. That I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Grace demonstrated through power. Do you remember the story, the story of Paul's conversion? Right? He's been uh, given permission and commissioned to go arrest uh, followers of, they didn't call them Christians at the time, followers of the way, followers of Christ, uh, of Jesus, who are in Damascus. So he's, on, he, he's traveling down the road on his way to Damascus. He's going with the intent to arrest, imprison, potentially kill those simply because they believe in Jesus. Like that is where he's going. That is what he's doing. He's, and he's saying here, by the gift of God's grace. You know, I hear some people talk about like, like who, who haven't accepted Christ or haven't given their life to him. Um, and they say things or you, you get that sentiment like, well, I just got to get some stuff together first. I, you know, I got I to gotta get a little bit cleaned up and then I'm going to come to Christ. I mean, think, I mean, listen, Paul didn't clean himself up before he came to Christ. He didn't come to Christ. Christ came to him. Yeah. And what he's saying is, listen, I was in, not only was I a sinner, like I was on my way to go imprison and murder people because they believed in Jesus. And it was in that moment, it was as I was going to sin, as I was going to rebel against Christ, as I was in my worst spot, Christ came and showed up there. There is no cleaning yourself up. The gift of God's grace. I'm talking about through the demonstration of his power. Boom, a light, and he speaks from the light. What are you doing? <laughs> Paul's like, who are you? I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. Power demonstrated, great. And so he's, and I, I, can, I can just see as he's writing these letters from prison, reflecting on that moment that God called him in grace and power. And then he says this, although I am less than the least of all of the Lord's people, this grace is given to me. Now this is an interesting statement because and for the longest time, I just thought Paul is being um, like dramatic <laughs> or um, I don't know, like just over the top humble. Like, okay. <clears throat> In fact, if you heard somebody say that, if you heard somebody talk about themselves as, oh, I'm the least, I am less than the least of all of God's people, what would you say? Oh, come on, don't talk about yourself like that, right? Know what you'd say? <clears throat> don't talk about yourself like that. Like, man, that's, that's, no, you're not, you're not bad. No, come on, you're not, you're not all, right? Isn't that what we do, right? We, we, we try to encourage them, we try to pick them up. No, 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 you're not bad. No. So is, is, is Paul, like, throwing a little pity party? Is that what, he, is that what he's doing? Is he <clears throat> just wallowing in this self-pity of, oh, I'm just a nobody? <clears throat> well, what's interesting is the sharp contrast between that statement and the next. I'm less than the least of all of the Lord's people. This grace was given to me. And then he goes on to talk about this grace and, and this, this calling that he has. This grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery for 
which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. What is he saying? He's like, I know my calling. God has called me, saved me for this moment in history to be the herald, to, to, to be the, the champion, to be the mouthpiece declaring the new covenant of grace in which God has extended to all of Gentiles for all of future time moving forward. That doesn't sound like a pity party. That sounds arrogant. We hear somebody talk like that, and we say, oh, okay, come on now, off your high horse. <laughs> right? I know your calling's great and everything, but you're not as important as you sound like you think you are, right? It's, in, it's interesting how, how we go from, like, pity party to I am the, like, herald of God's grace to all of the world. But I'm like, no, I... I I want to touch on this. I want to back up for a verse real quick because this is really cool. In verse 7, I almost missed it. He says, I became a servant of this gospel. Then he goes on to talk about like the servant of the gospel. What is he talking about? He's talking about his calling to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. The servant of the gospel. Uh, what's interesting, you know, sometimes in other places, when Paul's writings, he talks about his call, right? Being called to this place and called to that place and called to preach the word and called to all this. And, and we, we use that phrase a lot today, right? I'm called to do this ministry. I'm called to help here. And I'm called to go to Guatemala. Or I'm called to go to my next door neighbor. I'm called to, to meet this need. I'm called. We use that phrase a lot. But I wish we used the phrase that he uses in verse 7 more often. I became a servant of this gospel. I love that. I became a servant of the gospel. Called has this authority, yes. Uh, that's, that's not a bad thing, but this is a whole different nuance to our calling. I'm a servant of the gospel. I'm a servant of the story of redemption. So it just made me this week, just as I was reading this, it just made me pause and say, what is, what is the gospel asking of me in my neighborhood? What is the gospel asking of me in my workplace? What is, what is the gospel demand of me in my family? What is the gospel demand of me in the relationships that I have? I love that phrase. Paul says, I am a servant of the gospel. The gospel is a, sends us to all. It's not just, oh, I've got this calling to go do this here. No, no, no. What if we woke up every morning and said, Father, what is your gospel desire of me today? Where does your gospel want to go through me today? The servant of the gospel. So even in his calling, he, in, in that the place of, of privilege, what his calling was, he, he still ties it back to this, this, this brokenness, this weakness, this servitude. So we've got these two extremes that we're seeing. Even back, you know, now we, we back up a little bit. We see, you know, he's a prisoner. He plays the prisoner card. Then he plays the calling card. Then he's the least of everybody. And then he's, then he's, then he's, he's preaching to the, to the world again. Last week, Pastor Robin, he spoke on childlike faith. And, uh, and, he, and he touched on elements of, of our identity. Talking about our identity is a challenging thing. It's not just a Christian thing. It's a worldwide thing. We want to know who we are. We want to know our identity, right? And we see people struggling through those things. You hear conversation about identity, especially in church, our identity in Christ, what that means. But what I'm, what I'm afraid, sometimes, not always, sometimes we, we get some things confused. We, we confuse when we talk about identity, what we're really describing is, is uh, our confidence. Oh, let me explain. So maybe you're on, on this end of the scale, right? And, and um, where you're just, your confidence is low. You feel way down. Uh, things aren't working right for you. You're having hard times everywhere you go. And your confidence is just low. 
you begin to say things, well, I'm less than the least of everybody. And, and what does people come up to you and say, no, no, you're not that bad? What do they try to do? They try to drag your confidence level up a little bit, right? So that you can feel better about yourself. Well, feeling better about yourself is not exactly identity, right? They just realize, and, and sometimes you'll realize, well, I know I'm not supposed to feel this way or be this way. So, well, you know, I just need to, I need to you know, pull myself up by my bootstraps and just get better. So I can start going here. But then what happens? You, you, you find some confidence. Maybe you're over here and like all of a sudden you're, you're in charge of a project at work and it goes off well and your boss gives you a compliment. He doesn't compliment anybody. And all of a sudden you're like, hey, okay, that's just what I needed just to get going. And you start moving. I'm feeling better. I'm feeling, I'm feeling a little bit more confident. This is not identity. This is confidence. Um, and I'm feeling a little bit better. And I'm feeling better about myself. Yeah, and I'm, I'm getting going. Then I get a promotion, and then, right? And, and the next thing you know, like my confidence has grown so big that I'm just like on the top of the world. Now everybody's not saying, hey, pick yourself up. Now they're saying, okay, come back over here, right? All right, come down a little bit. You've, you, you've, you've gone a little too high. Sometimes when we talk about identity, what we're really saying is we all need to live in the, the, this medium acceptable confidence range. If your confidence gets too low, then we'll tell you to bring it up a little bit. If your confidence gets too high, we'll tell you to tone it down a little bit. But we all need to stay in this moderate level of confidence. And if we stay here, we're okay. See, and we do this uh, spiritually too. Like, I'm the worst. I'm the worst sinner. And, and why did God even love me? And, I, and he does, I'm not even worth his love. And someone says, no, 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 no. You're a child of the king. And you're like, oh, okay, sure, I guess. Okay, I start understand, understanding that. Then you come over here. You're like, man, I am, I am unstoppable. And, and God is, is, is amazing. And you're like, wait, isn't that supposed to be good? Yeah, it is, but just wait. Um, and you, you go on and on about, and, and then and you're, just, you're on top of the world. And some of the people will be like, oh, okay, come on. <laughs> you're, you're not as, as awesome as you think you are. Let's, let's, let's pull back in. What we're talking about is not identity. What we're talking about is confidence. But we misunderstand the two. They're tied together, but we misunderstand the two. And, and, and here's the thing. When your confidence is really low, it's, oh, my identity is all off. Or your confidence is really high, oh, my identity is off. You can be walking right down the middle and your identity still be off. Because they're two separate things. And here's how I know they can be true. is because Paul, in one sentence, is identifying with both ends of the scale. Which means it's not just a, 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 a where you're at on the confidence scale at any given time. He, he's referencing both ends of this. Which means his confidence is grounded in something more real than, than the circumstances or my emotional state. Right? Again, your identity is connected. I mean, there's emotional ties with all of us. God made us emotional. But how I feel today does not change or affect my I true identity, right? However, we think that if you're walking down the middle aisle of confidence, then everything must be good inside. But let's be honest. How many of you have ever been here, but you project over there because you know that's better than here? If you haven't, you've met people who have. They're so hurting on the inside. They know that this is all a mess. So they over-project, and then they look like they're arrogant, but really they're just broken. It's nothing to do with our identity. It has to do with this, this confidence thing and how we portray ourselves. But what we see here in, in Paul... I'm the, I am less than the least of all God's people. For the longest time, like I said, I like, Paul, come on. And then I started thinking about it. No, no, no. He was a Christian murderer. <laughs> Paul, you were a mess. Okay, I get the less than all. Like, I've done, like, things that I'm not proud of. I've never killed anybody because they believed in Jesus. Paul, you're worse than me. <laughs> that's, that's, that's not right. Anyway, um... But, but I get it. But then he, he moves quickly over to his identity, and his identity in his, is, 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 is in his calling. I am. I'm not just called. It's not something I do. It's not just something, this ex external thing in my life. I am a servant of the gospel. This is who I am. 
My identity is so in Christ that the central theme of Christ is the central theme of my life. And friends, there is incredible authority in, in finding your identity in the call of God. There is incredible authority in finding your identity, not just in the call as in the tasks of God, but in the central theme of Christ's sacrifice, his grace, and his power in my life. So how do these things merge? Here's the thing. Paul says that we're a new creation, right? The old is gone, the new has come. And here's this, 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 and I'm just going to be, I'm going to be honest, I'm going to walk, so much of our theology and our spiritual understanding is, 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 is as we talk about, it, it, it hinges on this very, very delicate tension. And I'm going to do my best, I don't want to dismiss either side, I want to do my best to, to, to understand this tension without taking anything off the table. Because Paul's got both of them on the table right now. I'm the less... I'm less than the least of the believers, and yet my calling is to change the world, inspired by the authority of God. The value of Christ, the brokenness of humanity. The authority of our identity in Christ, and the brokenness of our frail state. We wrestle with this, no kidding, (laughs) because these are massive extremes. So are, are we supposed to live this, this, this back and forth kind of spiritual existence, or how does this work? So I, I believe that the, the Bible clearly, clearly teaches that when we have been made new, we've been made new. Right? That we're not who we once were. We're not the brokenness of our past life. We are not what people did to us, the victims that, we, that, we, that we've been experienced as in our, our formal life. We, we, are, we are not the, the sinners as, as, as we have once been, but now we take on the righteousness of God. We close the door on that life that we can move forward in Christ. However, there's an element, even though Paul closed the door on his formal life, he knew what was behind the door. He, he, he didn't allow what was behind that door. He didn't allow that past life to bring condemnation. He addressed that in Romans 8.1. There's now no condemnation for those in Christ. He didn't allow that which was behind that door, that the past life without Christ. He didn't allow that to, to bring shame and guilt into his life. The door was closed, but he knew what was behind that door. It didn't, it didn't bring in shame. It didn't bring in guilt. It didn't bring in condemnation. But simply knowing what was behind that door yielded praise to God because he knew he didn't deserve where he was standing. Does that make sense? There's it, it, a fine line. Because what happens to so many of us Christians is that we have shut that door so long ago that we now take the, 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 the supernatural, incredible, life-changing things of the gospel become so familiar, we lose our awe. I don't think God wants us to do that. Paul didn't. He says, I'm, the, I'm, I'm, the, I'm less than the least of them. Why? Because he knew who he was. He knew what was behind the door. The door was closed. It wasn't affecting his heart anymore. It wasn't affecting his life. God had healed him of things. God had forgiven him of things. He is a new creation, but he knew what was behind the door. And because of that, <laughs> it just caused gratefulness and praise to well up inside of him. It's a challenge. So many of us, we, we, get, we get stuck in this woe is me spiritual existence because of our past. Others, we want to close the door on it so tight and forget about it and throw away the key and never look back at it again and just pretend that I never was that wretched, miserable person that I was, that selfish, uh, prideful person that I was. I want to pretend that I never was and just pretend that I have just been perfect my whole life. But friends, we haven't. And that's not the gospel. Every single one of us, we've got stuff behind the door. We're not to meditate on it. 
We're not to relive mistakes. We're not to relive those things in the past. We're supposed to close the door on it, but let it serve as a reminder that God is good, and he is a God uh, who gives the, this rich gift of grace to our lives. And knowing what I know about me, man, it just turns into praise to God for who he is. And here's what's cool. So verse 10, his intent was that now, this is just, I, I just spent so much time looking at this verse, and it's a bit of an interesting one, so let's take a look. His intent, so why do you do all this, this stuff, this calling of Paul? His intent was that now, through the church, the true believers in Christ, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. That word manifold, it, it, it's actually a, a Greek word that's used talking about, it really the best definition would be multicolored. It would be used to talk about the, the variety in, in different like tapestries and, and clothing or whatever. If they use multiple colors in their work. It's this multivaried, this varied wisdom of God, this manifold, this ex- expansive varied wisdom of God that exists in the church. But this is made known to the world? No. His intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God, the richness of all that he knows, the wisdom of God, should be na- made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. That's interesting. Some say, oh, that's the angelic beings. Some say that's the demonic beings. More commonly, it's just the spiritual world both sides. How in the world does the Gentiles being united with the Jews and the gift of, of salvation and the gospel declare God's wisdom to the heavenly realms who can see more clearly than we can anyway into the spiritual things? And I believe this is why. I don't know everything about angels and demons. We only have a limited amount of information in the word about it. But from the best that we can put together... However this works, the angels were just these amazing beings. They were just programmed to serve God all the time. They had a choice at one given time, and many of them fell away and followed Lucifer. They would now refer to them as demons, these angelic beings. But that's it. Like, they had that shot, yay or nay. They made their choice. Now it is what it is. And they look at the human race who every single day make choices not to serve God daily. We choose rebellion. We choose ourselves. We choose foolishness. We choose sin. We are weak. We are feeble. We are restricted by this this material world that we live in. We are broken. We are fallen. And all of the spiritual world looks down at this and goes, and yet, the creator of the universe, of whom we never stop declaring his praise and worship all times with as much spiritual hoorah as you could possibly come up with, the creator of all things, the God of the universe, the infinite one, has chosen to pour out his unending grace and love on this broken mess? First Peter 1.12 says, and the angels long to look into these things. It doesn't make sense. But here's the deal. If we were, and there's different spiritual lines of thinking that would argue this whole both and point. Some some spiritual line of thinking will say like we are nothing we just know we're nothing make sure god is everything because we are nothing we're nothing we're nothing we're nothing we're nothing but if the angelic beings were going to look onto that they'd be like yep no mystery there (laughs) if we were to come over here and be like we're everything we're everything we're everything i mean god is i mean because of who i am we're everything we just just put this out of my mind let's forget about the old past life i'm just i'm just going to be like god is amazing i'm everything and the angels would look down at that and be like, nope, you're wrong, actually. I'm way better than you. The mystery, the awe, 
the wisdom of God that, that blows away even the angels and demons is that God loves us miserable people. And he's taken us from our brokenness and he's called us his righteousness. And he's given us a role to play in his kingdom. To be servants of the gospel that declare this mystery to the world. It's still a mystery to the world and the culture that we live in today, isn't it? Like everybody loves to point the fact that we're hypocrites uh, in the church, right? The church is a bunch of hypocrites. Absolutely. Because I can't live the standard the Bible talks about. Like I'm just, I'm going to try really hard. By God's grace, I'm going to get better. But the world doesn't understand it. The truth of the matter is, and, and this is, is a hard one, we, we, we tend, most of us tend to lean to one, like, like every time we use a scale, right? We always tend to tip, right? One way or the other. There's some of you who are here today, and you're, you're, your natural bent is to end up in this spot of woe is me, I'm miserable, I don't deserve anything. And I want you to hear God speak identity into you today. I want you to know how much God loves you. That he doesn't just love you, that he chose you. That it, it, I love when, when Paul says, his strength is made complete, made perfect in my weakness. Because of your past life, God gets even more glory. Because it shows an even deeper depth to his grace. You don't need to be ashamed of the life that you lived before you knew Christ. You didn't know Christ. And God has made you new. I know, I know. But I, I, it's not since I knew Christ. It, it's since I've known Christ and I'm still a failure. Yeah, me too. Okay. But this isn't who I am. And Paul reminds us of that over and over in his gospel. This is not who I am. I, I've been given a calling. And it's not just a calling not to sin. It's a calling to be a champion of the gospel. It's a calling to represent him everywhere I go. It's a calling to, to yield my preferences and my desires to, to, that his name would be glorified. God trusts you to represent him before the world that's watching. Man, you are valuable in his kingdom more than you could ever possibly imagine. And then there's some of you, maybe, like, that's no, that's no surprise to you. And you, you, you tend to operate in this side of the spectrum. And it's easy for pride to leak in. See, this is where the Pharisees lived. It's easy to see the sin in everybody else, but you've perfected this thing, right? Or at least that's the front that you put up. You've convinced everybody else, maybe you even convinced yourself. I just want to remind you, not for the sake of guilt, not for the sake of condemnation, not for the sake of, of shame, but I want to remind you that you've got a closed door back there somewhere too. It's not to our shame, it's to his glory. Let's remember that the ones that we tend to look at and just go, ah, they, they, they just need to get their stuff together. Let me remind you, at one point in time, you did too. See, because Paul here understands the richness, the richness of understanding who he is. See, I made jokes about Paul being conceited or cocky. He wasn't conceited or cocky. He had a strong and healthy understanding of his position before Christ. See, he knew who he was, so he could say with confidence, listen, God gave me a word for you guys. You need to listen to what it says. Man, I know I've got a past like you. I've done, I've done worse things than you have. I know what's behind my door, but I know what God has spoken to me today. So with confidence and freedom and authority, let me tell you what God has for you today. Some of you have never walked in that kind of freedom in your Christian life before. It's not an Apostle Paul thing. This is a Christian thing. He goes on. 
In verse 11, uh, so according to the heavenly realms, or according to his general purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus, our Lord, in him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. We got to know him and have faith in him. We got to know who we are. We got to know what he's done for us. We have to understand his gospel, that we, the gospel of Jesus is this, that yes, we were sinners. Yes, we were separated from Christ. No matter what we did, it doesn't even matter, but we had a life of who we were. We lived for ourselves, but today that's not who we are anymore. We are, we are, we are a child of the king. We are co-heirs with Jesus. We are commissioned as servants of the gospel. I can stand tall and have authority, not cocky, but have authority, knowing that God has given me something for this world. God has called me to represent him well. God has called me to show the world what this new covenant living is all about. And I may not do it perfect, but I know who I am. Friends, sometimes we have such a a tough time. We have such a tough time understanding or relating to God, and am I doing it right? Listen, it, it, it all comes back to do we know who we are in him? It all comes back to the gospel a broken people called with a Holy Spirit-inspired authority. They don't really fit together well normally, and yet somehow it's the, the life that we're called to. So he finishes with this. I, I ask you, therefore, not to dis- be discouraged because of my suffering for you, which are your glory. Again, he, he finishes touching back to his suffering. <laughs> you know, don't even worry about it. Don't even worry about it. Yeah, I'm not, I'm, okay, I'm less than comfortable right now. <laughs> and yes, it's for you. <laughs> but don't feel bad. Because I know who I am. I'm not going to throw a pity party because I'm in jail. Clearly God's in control. I know who I am. And he's going to take care of me. And if my days end in this prison, hey, so be it. Don't even feel bad. I just represent him well. Don't, don't even worry about it. See, Paul was, was, uh, was aware of his frailty, but he didn't, wasn't defined by his frailty. He was defined by who Christ ca- called him to be. He, wasn't, he was aware of his frailty, but he was not defined by his frailty. He was defined by who God called him to be. Friends, if we can, man, this is, if we can work this out, we don't, we don't need to have sermons about go reach other people for Jesus. We, we won't need to anymore. We, we won't need to encourage one another to, to share our faith. We just won't need to anymore. Because if we know who we are and the authority of God that is planted in us and lives in us. If we know who we are, servants of the gospel of Christ, friends, no longer will we wallow in our sin, wallow in our frailty, wallow in our brokenness, but we will live up to the calling to which he has placed in our lives. So let's be a church, right? like, like Paul describes, a church that declares his gospel everywhere we go. That starts on an individual basis. It starts on an individual level. Will we be who God has called us to be? Or will we continue to this, this back and forth? Well, I'm not good enough. I've uh, got a big head and this back and forth thing that we do. And I, I want to I have, and it's a, a lifelong pursuit, but I want to I I see him clearly, that I would see myself clearly. Amen? God, we praise you and thank you because you are good. God, you are the author of history and the future. And frankly, you're a good writer. You know what you're doing. Why me? Why us? Why now? Why Paul? I don't know, but it's to your glory that we stand here broken but whole. Frail, but with authority. God, may we understand, may we grasp the richness of our identity in you. May we grasp the depth 
of your love and grace for us. Father, I just want to pray for my friends who are in here today that they just wrestle with guilt and shame and condemnation. Father, your word says that he who the Son sets free is truly free. Paul just told us right here, It's in you and in faith in you that we will experience true freedom and true confidence. Not a confidence that's that's dictated by the circumstances that we face, but a confidence that is grounded in, in you and who we are in you. Keenly aware of the reality of our frailty, but even more keenly aware of the greatness of your sovereignty. Father, give us right vision. Give us healthy sight that we can see you fully and walk in identity in you. Father, we love you, Lord. It's your name.